It's Gregory Grigorovich Samidzi on my inter in my internal passport. Grisha, if you share a drink with me. City of residence, Tashkent, Uzbekistan, the middle of nowhere, but I've known worse. My year of birth is 1931, which makes me 35, not an old man, but with my teeth I look 50. My ethnic nationality is Georgian, but I was born and grew up in France until I was 15. My earliest memory is a taste of amber Georgian cognac fed to me in my silver baby spoon long before I had a cup of my own or teeth, circumstances beyond my control, you might say. But when added up, helped to convict me of cosmopolitan and bourgeois origins when I returned to Mother Russia. But that was later. Not even Siberian permafrost could take away memories of blissful childhood years in Paris, where my parents had French and English friends, emigres and artists from Russia and Poland, who gave me a head start in the language department, a precocious palate for cuisine and wine, and problems later on with the above-mentioned powers that be. If you look at the fine print of my internal passport, you see I am a journalist. There's nothing so blatant as former gulag numbers such and such inscribed there, but the Organi, the secret police, no. The Organi don't let you slip through the net. They have code words. I could never move to Moscow or Leningrad or even my native Tbilisi in the Soviet Socialist Republic of Georgia. Those are the essentials, except for a look in my eyes that tells them they won't get more out of me this lifetime. Even they know when to quit trying to squeeze blood from a stone. <clears throat> Generally, I'm left alone to drink and to prowl after I've done an afternoon's work at the paper. Some perfectly pleasant moments are granted me. I expect they'll rewrite the history of our miserable Russian, cent Russian century any number of times, and fortunately I won't be around to read it. As it is, I don't look at my own copy after I make my evening deadline. I take the damp first page off the presses to wrap my bread, warm flat bread from the Alaisky Bazaar. That's something to care about, even with a smear of printer's ink on the sesame seeds. I didn't choose to live in Tashkent, though other Zeks got it worse, exiled above the tree line in the tundra, somewhere between Kazakhstan and the Amur River. Here in Uzbekistan, sometimes as early as March, the southern sun begins to warm the meat on your bones. Of course, we might have snow again, but alumni of Siberian winters know what cold is. By summer, the melons are bigger than soccer balls. Autumn is long and sultry. The dream is to find a woman while warmth lingers, swelling the gourd and plumping the hazel shells, as John Keats said. Those words I feel a kinship with, especially when I imagine poor John Keats shivering through English winters. My, be my editor is not a bad sort for an Uzbek, but there's not one of them that isn't connected to a whole registry of cousins. If I feel like putting my feet on my desk and blowing smoke rings, he'll say, Grisha, don't push things too much. My uncle, the publisher, might come in any moment and he won't like to see such lack of respect for our profession. For me, I don't mind, you're an artist in our midst, but you could shave yourself now and then. That's as far as it goes. And he won't fire me because I write circles around them. <laughs> as for tempting me with promises of two rooms, a stereo from abroad, pots of beluga, don't imagine they can lure me into political pandering. My black turtleneck sweater, this old one I'm fond of from Poland, some decent shoes that I've broken into my shape are quite enough fashion for me. For years now, I've lived in a one-room cottage, and though it's not large enough for a family of mice, I wouldn't like to give it up. I painted it myself in an edible red, like a can of American tomato soup. My record collection of American jazz means everything to me. If you had been there in the outer regions, and you served your time, you shouldn't become attached to anything. They can invade your hideaway, scattering your papers, smashing everything like so many freshly laid eggs. I am myself rather a magpie, 
not only collecting treasures but imitating other birds' songs. If opportunity offers herself, I make cozy with another's chap's warm-breasted mate. Dangerous. They always think they own your soul as well as any nest you happen to build. It's my nature to climb up to the highest apple. Sometimes in my discounted profession, I surprise myself. I can't help writing a good sentence now and then. A moment of detail when I describe a Russian colonial street where they've left a stand of lime trees, white fences, delicately carved blue wooden eaves. If I come upon a chai khana on a shady corner under fruit trees in the Uzbek quarter where old men in their colored robes drink tea, I might note that even Allah's heaven can't beat a dry, hot summer day when it's only an hour until the sun drops and the evening breeze comes up to make the fragrance of the grapes sweeter than kisses. My fingers itch and a word or two comes out about the deaf woman on the corner under my office who sweeps the dust with her ancient broom, sweeps against the sandy wind off the desert, this eternal babushka who's the muscle of our country. Sometimes a lyrical line slips out between my hack agricultural rep uh, excuse me, but between my hack agricultural reports. But should my editor ask me for a human interest story, I tell him to pass it on to someone else. I'm a specialist at production numbers, I say. It's true. I write down figures faster than someone, anyone else, but I am not a recorder of human emotions. Who needs sentiments after all? Let them wave their banners, roll out their tanks, and sing patriotic songs if they want. You won't find me at the reviewing stand, interviewing little girls they send up to present flowers to fat men with jowls hanging over their medals. Never.